Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Louise Ivers. I'm the director here at the Harvard Global Health Institute. Welcome to HDHI's Global Health Research and Innovation Speaker Series. This is our new monthly series hosted by HDHI. It's designed to showcase the latest advancements in global health research with the goal of fostering dialogue and elevating innovative solutions that advance health outcomes worldwide. We welcome you to uh, continue joining us for timely discussions this time every month. And today, I'm really delighted to be joined by Professor Carol Mitnick. Professor Mitnick will be presenting on innovation in the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis, the NTB clinical trial. I want to let everyone know that the recession is being recorded through Zoom and the recording will be made available on our website and YouTube page in the coming days. We will have time at the end for questions from the audience. So please submit your question through the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. We're gonna do our best to answer those questions during the end of the session. And with that, please allow me to introduce our speaker. Professor Mitnick is a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and an associate epidemiologist in the division of global health at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She has 25 years of experience in programmatic support, observational and experimental research, policy and advocacy related to increasing access to high quality treatment for tuberculosis, especially for drug resistant tuberculosis. Dr. Mitnick works in close collaboration with Partners in Health, specifically in Peru, Haiti, Kazakhstan, and Lesotho. In addition to teaching at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Mitnick mentors trainees in the Harvard Medical School Master of Medical Science in Global Health Delivery Program. She's the co-principal investigator of the NTB and NTBQ trials, two multi-country phase three randomized controlled clinical trials of all oral shortened novel regimens for rivampin resistant TB. She's also recently begun conducting research on post TB lung disease. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Mitnick to begin her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ivers. And thanks so much to the team at HGHI for um, providing the opportunity to share these uh, results with everyone today. I'm looking to share my screen. I am assuming that you can see my slides and the full version of my slides. Is that correct? Looks great. Great. So thanks again um, uh, for the opportunity to share the work of this uh, very large consortium um, depicted by all of the logos at the bottom. Um, and a special thanks to Unitaid for uh, supporting this work. So just a little bit of background um, on tuberculosis before I get into the trial, recognizing that not everyone thinks about TB all day, every day. Um, so tuberculosis is an airborne infectious disease. It disproportionately affects uh, impoverished individuals in communities within higher resource settings, and it also uh, disproportionately affects lower resource uh, countries. It is caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it kills uh, about a million and a half 1.3 million people each year. It is the greatest infectious killer of all time and the greatest infectious killer each year, only briefly displaced by uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, TB newly affects 10 million people each year of whom somewhere between 60 and 70% are diagnosed and treated the treatment is long. It's a lot longer than, say, you might have experienced for strep throat. Even the newer regimen is four months with four drugs, but most people receive a six-month four-drug containing regimen. Every year, in addition, or as part of those 10 million, about a half a million people fall sick with strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis that are resistant to the most important first-line drug, rifampin, or to rifampin and isoniazid. It's the other kind of anchor of that four-drug regimen. And then another million or so fall sick with other 
forms of resistant TB. So resistance is a huge problem, not terribly surprising considering that the primary treatment for TB has been around for about 75 years and it hasn't changed much in that time. The only vaccine we have is uh, ab is about 120 years old, and our primary diagnostic smear microscopy has been around since Robert Koch isolated the organism that causes tuberculosis. And these these lack lacks of innovation are really largely uh, a consequence of a failure to have adequate funding for TB. That gap is currently estimated at about $1.4 billion a year, and that's just for research. The gap for treatment is also massive. Let me, I just wanna get my, oops, sorry. Let me work on my uh, getting a better cursor. I never remember how to do this. Pointer options. Okay. So um, by way specifically of background for the trial I'm gonna discuss today, um, this is sort of the, the state of affairs of multidrug or rifampin resistant tuberculosis in 2013 when we first began to conceive of this trial. At the time, treatment for multidrug and rifampin resistant TB was long, it was complex, it was toxic with virtually everyone having really major adverse events. There was a high pill burden because the regimens involved uh, five, six, seven drugs, plus in a daily injection for somewhere between six and 12 months of the 18 to 24 months of total duration of treatment. And it was expensive upwards of or right around $10,000 per treatment course. And this treatment um, didn't have a great evidence base. It was really uh, based on expert opinion, which was the best we had at the time. Um, and outcomes globally were not very good with success reported in about half of patients treated in this time period. So when you think about the whole pie of the 500,000 new cases that occurred annually, of drug-resistant TB, only about 20% of that whole pie was getting diagnosed and treated, and only about half of those patients were getting cured. So that means about 10% of the 500,000 cases were diagnosed and successfully treated each year. So the demand for a better option was quite high. We had... Um, hopes of major improvements with the advent of the first new anti-TB drugs in about 50 years, um, come 2012, 2013, with the uh, marketing authorizations of the drug bedaquiline and delaminid, um, both with completely new mechanisms of action against mycobacterium tuberculosis, and both were granted marketing authorization based on phase two trials that showed that adding them to a background regimen reduced the time of um, sputum culture conversion, meaning reduced the time from um, being able to observe bugs in people's sputum to not being able to observe those bugs. While these trials um, established kind of a proof of concept that uh, these drugs could work, they certainly did not optimize the treatment regimens containing these new drugs. They really just added the drugs to that regimen that I was telling you about that was so complicated to, to deliver and, and was being received by so few. So we, to try to address this big gap, we established the NTB project together with this consortium of partners and funded by UNITAID. And the goals of the NTB project were simply to expand access to these new, newer drugs, as well as a couple of repurposed drugs that had been used for other indications, but were um, increasingly uh, shown to have activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis. We try, we're trying to find better, shorter, less toxic regimens, and also to generate and disseminate evidence in a way that would support greater uptake of treatment and also lower prices of these new drugs. 
The NTB uh, project comprised three um, studies, an observational study that essentially used those newer and repurposed drugs um, against the, the longer background regimen um, while we were awaiting results of these two trials. And today I'm going to speak about the NTB clinical trial, which was a trial examining treatments for patients who have uh, rifampin resistant, but fluoroquinolone susceptible TB, meaning that their strains were resistant to the most important first line drug, but susceptible to what was then the most important second line drug. The design of the NTB trial, um, I it's, um, it's summarized in four bullets here, which um, it reduces the complexity, it belies the complexity of the design. It was a randomized, controlled, uh, open label, a non-inferiority phase three trial, trying to understand the relative efficacy and safety of each of five experimental regimens to a standard of care control. We used Bayesian adaptive randomization, which allowed us to adapt the randomization based on um, interim treatment response. So that in theory, one could randomize more individuals to regimens that were performing better in the course of the trial. This is the first time we this um, approach had been used in a TB trial. It was borrowed from uh, cancer, cancer trials. And one of the advantages of the Bayesian adaptive randomization is it allowed us to uh, try to uh, identify as many regimens as possible that were non-inferior rather than just trying to pick, pick a single winner. Um, a little more detail on the design. So all participants went through a standardized um, screening process. And if they met all of the eligibility criteria, which I'll mention in, in a second, they were randomized among these six arms. So the five experimental arms and the um, standard of care control arm. All participants were followed up for a minimum of 73 weeks and 73 weeks was the primary um, endpoint to evaluate safety and efficacy. And then we also followed most participants for 104 weeks, but we actually truncated follow-up when the last participant had been had reached uh, 73 weeks of follow-up. Um, you can see this is a, a, a summary of the schedule of study visits, and you can see that they were very intensive for the first three months, roughly weekly. Um, a little less intensive for the remainder of the first year, occurring at about uh, once a month. And then for the remainder of the follow-up period, they occurred roughly every six to eight weeks and were quite extensive in, in what we were evaluating at each of those visits. Um, uh, more detail on the regimens. My co-PI has um, found an octopus to try to explain this, although I still don't understand how it's got uh, only seven arms, but we'll, we won't worry about that right now. Um, so each of the regimens contained at least one of the new drugs, bedaclin and or, and or delaminid. Each of the regimens also contained a fluoroquinolone. As I mentioned, that was really the foundation of drug-resistant TB treatment at the time. And each contained the first-line drug pyrazinamide, which had been very important to regimen shortening for drug-susceptible TB. And then they were balanced out by these repurposed drugs, clofazamine and linazolid, trying to achieve a combination of having of drugs that would be active against different stages of mycobacterium tuberculosis and also um, balancing out the toxicity risks. The um, include, we included uh, patients who had pulmonary tuberculosis that was resistant to rifampin and susceptible to quinolones. Um, they, we included adolescents and adults. We did not include uh, people who were pregnant at the time of enrollment, but we were able to retain people who became pregnant during their study 
participation. And we excluded uh, patients who had um, contraindications to receiving the study drugs, who had prior exposure to the study drugs, um, and who had severe uh, lab abnormalities or other uh, cardiac risk factors, given that the drugs um, have important toxicity profiles in those areas. Um, ultimately, we screened, um, uh, we enrolled in seven countries in 12 sites. We screened 1,539 individuals to randomize 754. And the study teams completed a total of 18,000 visits across the life of the study. You can see that the geographical distribution is quite diverse. About a quarter of the popu study population came from uh, Peru in South America. Uh, just over half from uh, Eastern, uh, sorry, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, just under 20% from South Asia and just under 20% from Southern Africa. So we had really important heterogeneity, particularly in some of the comorbidities that are common among people who have drug resistant TB. And I'll show you that shortly. Um, this is the timeline. So the first participant was enrolled in Georgia in February of 2017. And then the last participant was included in uh, late 2021. There is um, the non-trivial matter of the COVID-19 pandemic that, that interceded. And I really have to give a huge shout out to our teams who did just heroic work to ensure that study participants could continue to receive their treatment, could complete visits, and to keep themselves and the study participants as safe as possible during this really uh, tumultuous time in some of the places that were hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, as is typical in a non-inferiority trial, we had two main analysis populations for efficacy. The safety population included anyone who got at least one dose of study treatment. The modified intent to treat population uh, was derived from the safety population and those who had a disease that could be confirmed by culture um, and that did could be confirmed not to be caused by bugs resistant to any of the important study drugs. And then the per protocol population is really a population where you try to get a handle on um, kind, of, kind of eliminating all the noise and can you just try to understand what happens if people get the study treatment exactly as it was intended to be delivered. So now I'm um, starting with some results. Um, you can see the number of participants screen, patients screened, and, and then randomized, um, the numbers randomized ended up being relatively equal because the regimens were performing relatively consistently early on. So the adaptation did not make a big difference. Um, there were just a few patients excluded from the safety population because they didn't start uh, their uh, study treatment. And then more participants excluded from the MITT population, notably from ARM5, where a disproportionately high number was excluded. Most of the exclusions you can see were because they didn't have positive cultures at um, prior to starting treatment or because there was resistance to one of the uh, study drugs. And then there's further loss from the MITT population primarily because people uh, were not able to complete at least 80% of their assigned treatment within 120% of the duration uh, allowed, um, oh, sorry, of the intended duration of the regimen. And it's worth noting that in the, in the longer control arm, um, people, a larger proportion uh, were lost from the per protocol population. So we, this, these are the numbers that we end up with in the per protocol population. Um, the uh, baseline characteristics, just uh, in the whole group, I'm not showing these by arm. There were not big differences by arm. You can see that it was a relatively young population, majority male, 
just over half had resistance to pyrazinamide, which I mentioned was in all of the experimental arms. That was not surprising to us, but there was no rapid test that allows um, reliable detection of pyrazinamide resistance at baseline. So we couldn't have that information. Plus there was some indication prior to study start that pyrazinamide may have synergistic activity with other drugs allowing it to have some benefit even in the presence of resistance. About 15% had HIV co-infection, about 15% had diabetes, smaller proportions had hepatitis B or C co-infection, and sputum smear positivity used as kind of a proxy of burden of disease um, was common as was uh, cavitary disease on x-ray. The um, summary of the efficacy results, most importantly, or not most importantly, but I just wanna start by noting the um, really uh, high efficacy of the control regimen compared to what I had mentioned at the beginning, compared to a, a, a standard of about 50 or 60%, which was what we were seeing when we planned the trial. So by using a very rigorous um, standard of care control, and I failed to mention one that complies with current WHO recommendations, we allowed the control to kind of be modernized as recommendations were changing during the life of the trial to try to optimize our, our comfort with saying that if there were non-inferior regimens, they were non-inferior to a good standard. And so what we found is one regimen, um, NTB2, uh, containing bedaquiline, clofazamine, linazolid, levofloxacin, and pyrazinamide, was both non-inferior and superior to the control. NTB1 and NTB3 were non-inferior to the control in, in the MITT and the per-protocol populations, while NTB5 was non-inferior only in the modified intent to treat population, and NTB4 was not non-inferior in either uh, the per-protocol or the MITT population. I'm not showing any of the other analyses we did. Um, these are the 73 week endpoints, but the results were consistent across the 104 week endpoint. They were consistent when we adjusted for uh, pre-specified uh, potential confounders, when we adjusted post hoc for um, uh, possible confounders, um, and also uh, at 104 weeks and in other sensitivity analyses. So the consequence of that, those very consistent results is that we had robust evidence for the non-inferiority of three regimens, um, all containing bedaquiline and linazolid um, and different combinations together with the bedaquiline and linazolid. Um, and this really um, is a huge improvement by offering um, options for different patients, so there are different patient groups. So there is one shorter regimen that has come online um, during the time that the NTB trial was running. That regimen is currently recommended only for use in adults and adolescents. So the NTB regimens could be used in adults and adolescents along with that other regimen, as well as in children, since all of the drugs in the, in the non-inferior NTB regimens have pediatric formulations and WHO has endorsed their use in kids. Similarly, their use has been endorsed as having um, acceptable risk benefit ratio uh, during pregnancy. And we got these results in a population with severe tuberculosis and without selecting out people who have important comorbidities. Um, MDR-TB is a very complex disease. It often affects people who are, live in complex social conditions and have other comorbidities. And it was very important to be able to include those trials and, and uh, include those groups and have results in the, that, that reflect those groups. Um, NTB5, for which the results were equivocal, does uh, offer a possible, um, the first possible shortened all oral alternative for patients who can't take linazolid or bedaquiline, as those are in all of the other current recommended regimens for MDRTB. 
And I already highlighted the importance of the well-performing control arm and that we can be confident of the non-inferiority of regimens compared to that well-performing control arm. Um, and uh, that also could improve the, the uh, perceived certainty of evidence resulting in strong re uh, recommendation um, conceivably by WHO, which will review these results next month and also by other normative bodies. The safety results, um, just starting with death, um, thankfully death was fairly uncommon um, in about 2% of the cohort compared to more like 20% in routine care and not big differences across the study arms in death. A common um, way we look at adverse events is the frequency of adverse events leading to treatment interruption. And you can see that that was more common in the um, longer control regimen um, and fairly similar in frequency across the other regimens, possibly a little bit more uh, withdrawal of a, of a single drug in the regimens that contained five drugs rather than uh, four. So we were um, really pleased to, to see the low mortality together with the efficacy results to see that while there was significant um, toxicity, it was um, uh, somewhat improved over that in the control arms. We had very, very rigorous follow-up for safety and a very well-structured um, pharmacovigilance uh, program supporting that. Um, we saw a lot of uh, linazolid-related toxicity. I didn't mention that in detail, but their um, linazolid is associated with peripheral neuropathy, with hematologic disorders, um, and um, also more uh, rarely with optic neuritis, but we saw that in both the control and experimental arms. Um, the cardiotoxicity, which was a big concern at the start with bedaquilin, was not a major issue. Um, nevertheless, even with these regimens, we still need um, good uh, adverse event monitoring for people on treatment. So just a quick word about other considerations in, in making these regimens available. So the price of these two new drugs had been very, very high. You can see that with bedaquilin, there's been a, a continued um, increase, uh, excuse me, decrease in the price since it was first released. With delaminid, we haven't really seen that decline yet, but are anticipating it in the next year as it has gone off patent. And what this means overall for the NTB regimens is that um, two of them are a uh, considerably less expensive than the longer standard of care. And they're even a little bit less expensive than that six month regimen that I mentioned, but really all three of these um, shortened regimens are much more affordable and they all have a lower daily pill burden for, um, uh, we were just using the group of 35 to 50 kilogram patients as an example, a much lower pill burden than the longer regimen. We have a whole host of additional resources um, on the NTB website, um, including a preprint, a uh, link to a preprint of the manuscript pending uh, peer reviewed publication. We have more detailed slideshows. And then there is also, um, we are launching a data sharing initiative to share data from all three uh, NTB studies. Um, and that will be available through the NTB website as well. Um, just a final word on um, kind of some of the innovations uh, in the NTB trial, and, and I'm going to take this opportunity to answer a few of the questions that came in at the time of registration as well. Um, so it's somewhat unusual for um, three direct service healthcare NGOs with human rights and social justice orientations, so Partners in Health, Doctors Without Borders, and Interactive Research and Development, to take on a clinical trial. And I, we, we uh, did that, the groups did that, because um, of the huge gap that is left by the commercial approach to drug development, that it does not try to optimize treatment. We also built into the trial the principles of accompaniment that um, really uh, define the work done by uh, PIH and the other organizations, meeting patients where they are, trying to provide 
person-centered care, filling gaps that make it hard for people to complete treatment, including food, including uh, income or employment opportunities and management of comorbidities. And all this is linked to questions about how to help improve adherence and accompaniment is the number one way and having clinicians listen to patients is probably the number one way to improve adherence. Um, we also engaged with community in multiple ways, um, probably not as much as we should have, but that is also critical to adherence and understanding what people with disease really value. And it seems obvious, but in TB, we don't do it a lot. There was the recent case of studying and rolling out a four month regimen for drug susceptible TB, assuming that duration is the most important point. And what we're finding out now is that patients are more or as concerned about um, about the tolerability of the regimen and their ability to go about their daily lives while they're still on treatment. And if it's if it's more tolerable in six months or easier to take because it's fewer pills and it's six months, there are some patients that would prefer that over a four month regimen. And so understanding what, what um, the affected community wants is so key. Um, we also, uh, this collaboration includes what I'm calling access warriors, um, people who are really highly cognizant of the fact that the free market does not solve the problem of a disease that disproportionately affects impoverished populations. Um, but that we also can't shoot ourselves in the foot by whining about the fact that the free market doesn't work or sort of being mouthpieces for industry that complains that they can't make the drugs cheaper because the market is too small. And I'm going to... Um, just uh, cue the uh, the time for five initiative, which we'll talk about at the at the very end, um, and the responsibility really of um, of industry when it is getting large uh, infusions of public funds to develop tools, develop drugs, develop diagnostics to be accountable to um, for making those affordable. Um, the uh, pharmacovigilance I mentioned, and that was critical. We, although it's meant to be standard in in countries to report on post marketing toxicity, it doesn't happen much in TB. Um, we uh, got this money from Unitaid, as I've already mentioned a couple of times. This was the first time Unitaid had ever funded a TB trial, and one of the first trials uh, overall they funded. And so that's part of the innovation in global health is trying to find new new partners in this space and not accepting that the pool of resources is what it was ten, you know, in the last 10 years. I talked about some of the design uh, innovations already and, and highlighted um, the uh, importance of having a heterogeneous population um, inclusive of all those who will ultimately need uh, treatment for TB, uh, drug-resistant TB. And I know I've gone over a little bit. I just want to briefly um, acknowledge the enormous team, all of the uh, patients who were screened and the participants actually in the trial, um, as well as our partners on the ground um, in the, the all of the countries where we worked. Um, and here's just a photo to give you a sense of the magnitude of, of the study team for the NTB trial. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, that was really fantastic. Uh, we, have a, we have a number of questions coming in, so I'm delighted to kind of spend the last 10 minutes going through those. <clears throat> one thing... One thing I want to ask you about is related to the low death rate and the very good control outcome. We had a question from the audience about how the treatment was administered. Was it all outpatient? Did people receive um, observed therapy? Can you comment a bit about the really excellent outcomes and control and the low deaths and maybe uh, respond to that question about how the treatment was administered? Sure, Louise. So on the um, in the control arm, I think in large part, I mean, I, so first, let me just say that in trials, um, we know that outcomes tend to be better than in routine care. There's just there's more rigorous follow up. Uh, there's more more attention. And, and again, that was also part of the the ethos of the organizations running the trial. Um, 
the control arm was also, as I mentioned, we were really trying to modernize it along with the recommendations and kind of anticipate changes in the recommendations. So they these were pretty aggressive, aggressive control regimens. Um, and uh, the treatment was uh, mostly outpatient in Kazakhstan and Georgia. Um, participants started in hospital irrespective of their medical condition in Lesotho or other places, they might start in hospital only if, if it was medically indicated. And yes, uh, treatment was, um, I prefer to use the term supported than directly observed, but there was contact with health providers for virtually every dose of treatment. Um, some of it was a video communication in part because of the pandemic. Uh, but also just to try to accommodate accommodate participants' schedules and needs. Oh, thanks. So sometimes in global health research, I observe that um, there's a willingness to allow the control arm to be, you know, whatever the background, often very under-resourced um, situation is. So I really admire how your collaboration had that elevation in the control arm. Um, from a technical perspective, like an epidemiological perspective, how did you address that change if there was a change in the control arm or because the study was quite a long period of time? Mm -hmm. I really respect that. Yeah. So first and foremost, we um we approached it as kind of a strategy, right? So it was comparing, it was comparing these standardized regimens to a strategy of individualized regimens. We um, kept a close eye on the changes that occurred over time. And the, the most significant change was the removal of the injectable agent from the regimens. These um, The injectable agents that are have been used historically cause bad ototoxicity as well as kidney, kidney problems. And so we were all very enthusiastic about removing the injectable when uh, that was endorsed by WHO. Um, we've also done some analyses stratified by um, where the comparison is stratified by the WHO recommendation period. There were three distinct sorry, there were three distinct recommendation periods. Um, and it doesn't show any major difference, although there is there is overall kind of a secular improvement in outcomes over the whole study period across all of the arms, interestingly. Very interesting. Um you were able to include some special, I'll call special groups. You had 14% of the study participants who were living with HIV. And then you also had women who became pregnant during the period of time. We have a couple of questions about antiretroviral interactions or outcomes. Could you say a little bit about what you know about the people living with HIV? And then maybe um, comment, if you can, about pregnancy and how we can think about women with you know who are pregnant people who are pregnant being included in clinical trials and, and yeah yourself. so um in terms of the the hiv so about i want to say it was about 85 percent of the hiv co-infected participants were already on antiretroviral therapy when they were enrolled in the trial and then uh, the remainder save a couple um, were enrolled in on art uh during their participation we there there is some information about interactions between uh, efavirenz in particular and some of the MGR drugs. So, um, if somebody was on an efavirenz based regimen, they had to change to a different regimen as part of the enrollment process. We do not have our pharmacokinetic results yet, but we will be doing looking at drug drug interactions uh, between the regimens and uh, antiretrovirals. Um, the question of including people who are pregnant, this has really been a huge issue the whole time. We tried from the beginning to include people who were pregnant at at the time we started the trial um, and were really, the, the biggest deterrent initially actually was um, insurance, trial insurance. We could not get coverage initially for the women who became pregnant or should anything happen to the fetus. Over time, um, we were able to in some of the countries, and so we added this stipulation that they could remain on trial if it seemed to be in their best interest. And we had a very elaborate 
a process for discussing between the pregnant participant and the investigator. Um, this was something that our community advisory board felt was really important because we end up with people, we, we end up with no data on treatment during pregnancy and then pregnant people showing up with drug resistant TB and providers don't know what to do. So we really wanted to, if nothing else, there were only, um, I want to say it was only 11, 11 people who became pregnant and stayed in study. Um, but if nothing else, it's a model. And, and we really are trying to share that model in all of our materials so that other trials could follow suit. Yeah, thanks. Um, including pregnant people in clinical research is challenging for a lot of regulatory and compliance issues. And then we end up without the information that we need. Yeah. Um, okay, we just have a few minutes left. So I'll try to combine a couple of questions um, which are related to perhaps hierarchies of regimens that you're seeing emerging from the data that you have um, for fluoroquinolone susceptible strains or whether, and the question of, as you share this information and you mentioned WHO reviewing some information from the trial, can you say a little bit to the audience about um, how you think this is going to play out in terms of being reviewed and part of policy or if some regimens will come out over others in terms of recommendations? <laughs> the $64 million question right now. Yeah, I, 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 we really don't know how it's, how it's going to play out. Um, I, I, I think we're, we're certainly hopeful that there will be a place in the WHO um, guidelines for these regimens um, uh, where they'll be, you know, ranked or in what sub for what subgroups they'll be recommended and whether that that recommendation will apply to, you know, one, two, three of the regimens. I I fear that I that I don't know at this point. I'm happy, happy to report back when we hear the results. Great. Um... Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time, but I know we did have more questions and we had a really engaged audience. I'm really grateful for our audience joining from all over the world. Uh, I, I think if you have more questions about this, you can find out more from the ntb.org website that Professor Mitnick shared. And also we're gonna post the video of this presentation on our, our channels. Uh, I'm sure that Professor Mitnick will engage in more discussion about the trial and the methods and the results and there's more to be uh, to be seen so just remains for me to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us um uh, carol it was really fantastic i learned a lot i always do and i know our audience did as well and thank the audience and hope that uh, you'll join us next month for our next session thank you so much thanks louise